Hello and welcome to the first of our revision course lectures for F9 on the syllabus content. So we're going to start here by looking at financial objectives. So this is a good overview of what the F9 course is really all about. And we can start by putting together the three main areas of the course. So we have investments. So these are the things that we're going to look at later on, such as investing in a new project, investing in a new product, or something along those sorts of lines, even investing in a new business, so buying over a new business. So those investments will be things that the finance manager needs to decide whether to do or not. That's where our investment appraisal comes in later in, on in the course. So we'll appraise those investments to see whether the investment is a good idea or not. So that's one of the main areas of this course that we'll be focusing on. Also then we'll talk about financing. Now financing is how we raise capital. Broadly speaking, we'll be looking at raising capital through uh, share issues and raising capital through bond issues. Now, you may also go to the bank and borrow money off them, but the two main areas are raising finance through shares or raising it through bonds. So that's the financing that we'll be looking at later on. And then we have dividend policy. So dividend policy is how we disperse the profit that the business makes. Again, the finance manager will be concerned with this. How do they go about taking that money, that profit that has been made by the business and distributing it to the shareholders? Or indeed, should they be distributing it? Or is there something else they should be doing with it? So broadly speaking, those are the three main areas on this course. If you know those all in a good bit of detail and the basics of all of it, well, then you're going to do very well. It's often also said that this is a triangular process because each of these are interlinked. And if the examiner is going to look at this particular area, it's the interlinkage between the three that they're going to look at. Because we can't make investments, so we can't buy a new business or we can't finance a new product if we don't have that financing. So if we don't raise capital through a share issue or we don't borrow money, we may well not have the money to invest in the new project. Now, if we don't invest in the new project, well then we won't be able to make profit to distribute through our dividends. So the dividends is linked in that way. Because if we don't make the profit through our investments, well then the dividend policy is irrelevant. Now in addition to that, we said that we may not pay out a dividend. Well, if we didn't pay out a dividend, we may not need the financing because we would have the business profit that we had made previously. And we could use that to invest in new projects. So there are lots of businesses that don't pay out a dividend because they need to reinvest the money that they've made to those investments to make more profit. So there's a linkage between all of this and it's often talked about as a triangle. So you can't have investments if you don't have the financing. If you pay out the dividend policy, you'll have to raise the finance. If you choose to keep the dividends and not pay them out, well then perhaps you can reinvest them in the business. So all of those are interlinked and we're thinking here about what the objectives are when we're thinking about that interlinkage and we're thinking about how the finance manager should run the business. Uh, and the key financial objectives will be the maximization of shareholder wealth. Now, if I could sum up this course in one sentence, that would be it, maximization of shareholder wealth. That should be in the back of your mind when you're answering every single exam question because that is what the finance manager is there for. That's what you're trying to do. So often, and I mean often, you'll be asked to calculate an increase in shareholder wealth. And that will be the share price growth plus any dividends paid. So that will be the difference between last year's share price and this year's share price plus any dividends paid. And you must know how to calculate that. We'll look at a short example before we do an exam question in a second. 
but that is crucially important. When you're framing your answers to any F9 question, you must bear in mind that maximization of shareholder wealth, the growth in the share price, plus the dividends paid, because that's what the shareholder will get. That's what they will get in terms of their wealth. They'll get the increase in the share price, and they may well get a dividend paid out on top of that. So that's the first and overriding financial objective. The next one is to increase the profit, of course. Now, that goes without saying, but we need to be aware that that can be manipulated. And that's why when we come to investment appraisal, we will often look at uh, cash flows rather than profit. Profit can be manipulated through accruals, for example, prepayments, provisions. Clever accountants are able to manipulate what the profit is. So we do need to be aware of that and we need to be able to state it as a limitation if we're looking at an increase in profits. Closely related to that, increasing earnings per share. Now that is profit because earnings is profit. So if earnings is going up and you haven't had a share issue or something like that, well then earnings per share will go up. And that's the earnings profit after tax, less preference dividends if there were any, but usually just profit after tax, over the number of ordinary shares. That's just telling us how much the business earned on a per share basis breaking down the profits into a per share. So this is important because uh, investors are interested in it. The stock market is interested in it. Analysts are interested in it. You'll often see reference to analysts. Analysts are those people who advise the stock market. They write reports on a business and their results and what they project for the business. And the market takes a lot of stock from what those analysts say, and they will want to see an increase in the earnings per share. It's a good sign for the business and something that the finance manager must focus on. So often what we'll be asked to do is to assess whether a business has achieved its financial objectives. You'll have to calculate the share price growth and dividends paid to see what the increase in shareholder wealth was. You'll have to calculate the earnings per share or even the price to earnings ratio, which you will have seen. So the price to earnings ratio will put the share price over the earnings per share. And that will tell you what the market thinks of the share. So for example, a business with a high price to earnings ratio means that the market is willing to pay a lot for that share in comparison to its earnings. Low price to earnings ratio, well then they're not so willing to pay that. They have some doubts about the business. So let's just have a look at the shareholder wealth illustration. So what we're gonna do for this is see what this increase in shareholder wealth has been. So shareholder wealth, if you're asked for the increase on a per share basis, you're simply looking for how much the share price has gone up and what dividend has been paid in that year. So we'll do this for year two. We want to calculate the shareholder wealth increase per share. So pause the video now and see if you can work it out. So here we have the share price growth plus the dividends paid. Now we can't do it for year one because we don't have the share price in year zero. So we don't have the previous year's share price. But in year two, we have share price of two. In year one, it was 150. So the increase in the share price is 50 cents. And the dividend paid in year two is six cents. So 50 cents plus six cents gives us 56 cents per share. So the increase in shareholder wealth per share is 56 cents. So that's how we do it per share. Now, what if we're asked as the shareholder wealth increase as a percentage? As a percentage of what? Well, you need to think here about what you need to invest to get that 56 cents per share. So to get the share price growth and the dividend, what would you need to invest? Well, you'd need to have invested at the original year one share price. So see if you can work out 
what the shareholder wealth increase is as a percentage based on that. So here we're looking for the increase uh, as a percentage. So what we'll do is take the increase per share over the share price in year one and be careful with this. It's always the previous year's share price because what we'll find then is that we have 56 cents uh, per share growth over the 150 cents. Now, if it was over the $2, that wouldn't be right because at $2, we've already had the growth from 150 to $2, the 50 cents. So that couldn't be right. To get that 50 cents growth from $1.50 to $2, we had to invest at the $1.50. So that's the figure we're looking for. Often that's where students fall down on this one, is they take the wrong share price. You need to take the previous year's share price because it's there that we get the share price growth and the dividend paid. So 56 cents over 150 cents is 37%. Lastly, we're looking for the dividend yield, which is really what the investment is yielding us. Always think of the yield as basically like an interest payment. So what that investment is yielding us. And that is the dividend per share in year two over the share price in year one. Because to get that six cents, we'd need to have invested in year one. So that will be six cents of a dividend over the year one share price of 150 cents. So that is four cents. So that is crucially important. Make sure that you know how to calculate shareholder wealth increase per share, the shareholder wealth increase as a percentage and the dividend yield. These are all interlinked. These are things that investors will look at to assess whether the business has achieved its financial objectives. So let's see how this comes up in a question. So we're gonna try and link all of this together. Also, you'll need some background knowledge for these from the full course, but hopefully you'll have that at this point. So we're gonna look at June 2010, question four, part A. So I suggest that you pause the video now and have a go at this question. See what you can come up with. Look at the marks that are available and try to manage your time. However, at this stage, we're not so much concerned with time allocation. We'll look at that more when we come to the end of the course to look at the mock exams. At this point, we just wanna get the right answer. So take a bit of time, have a go at the question and then work through the answer with me to see how many marks you would have picked up. So we're looking at June 10, question four, and we have a shareholder of QSX company. They're concerned about the recent performance of the company, and we're given some financial information. So part A asks us to calculate the dividend yield, capital gain, and total shareholder return for 08 and 09, and then we need to discuss them. So we need to discuss them with the returns predicted by CAPM, which we're given, and the other financial information provided. So we need to think about how many marks we're going to get for this. There are 10 marks in total for part A. So the calculations of the dividend yield and capital gain, etc. we could probably think we'll get about two marks for each. So that'll be on four marks for the dividend yield and shareholder return. Then we're thinking about two to three marks for each of the discussions. So that will take us up to our 10 marks. So we need to be sure we pick up all of those marks. So starting off with the dividend yield. So we learned how to do this in the session that we just did. We should have known previously, but we reminded ourselves of it anyway. So we're looking at the dividend yield. First of all, we looked at this in the short session that we did, and we should know how to calculate our dividend yield. So the calculation will be the dividend per share over last year's share price. So how much did we need to invest to get that dividend? So in 2008, well, we're told that the dividend per share in 08 is 38.5 cents. Now we need to put that over the last year's share price and in 07, the share price 
was $7.40. So that'll be the closing share price at the end of 2007. So that 38.5 out of 740 gives us a yield of 5.2%. So 38.5 over $7.40, 5.2%. Now, moving on to year 2009, well, that year we had a dividend of 40 cents. And the closing share price from 08 was $8.35. So 40 cents over 8.35 gives us 4.8%. So nothing difficult there unless you didn't know how to do the calculation. Make sure you use this year's dividend and last year's share price because we needed to invest at the end of last year to get the dividend for this year. So we can now move on to the next portion of this. And in this bit, we're asked for the total shareholder return and the capital gain. So the capital gain, remember, will be the amount that the share price has gone up. And we can take that as a percentage or we can just do it in total. So as a percentage tends to be the way the examiner wants it. So let's do that. So we'll take the year, the share price movement, and that will give us the capital gain in cents. We can then do that as a percentage. So first of all, in 2008, well, the share price in 07 was $7.40 and the share price in 08 was $8.35. So we can see therefore that the capital gain here will be 95 cents. So that's the increase in the share price. Now as a percentage, well what would we need to invest to get that capital gain? Well we'd need to have invested at the $7.40. So out of the $7.40, 95 cents is a 12.8% capital gain. So 95 cents is the capital gain. $7.40, well, we'd have to have invested in 07 at that price to get the 95 cents of a capital gain. So let's do the same again for 2009. This time the share price went up from the 835 to 648. In fact, that's a drop. So we had a share price going down from 835 to $6.48. So that's actually a capital loss of 187 cents. So we need to log that in our minds because when we do our discussion, that's going to be something we need to discuss. So that as a percentage is a 22.4% drop. So we had a drop of 22.4% there. So that's the percentage in capital gains we've made. They also ask for the total shareholder return. And we know that that is the capital gain plus the dividend paid. Now again, we can give it as a total, we can give it as a percentage, or we can give it as both. So looking at that, we'll take the year. To get the total, we'll have the capital gain plus the dividend. And to get it as a percentage, we'll put it over the previous year's share price. We also then have an alternative. I just want to show you the interlinkage here because if we add the percentage capital gain, so the percentage the share price has gone up by, plus the dividend yield, that will give us the same answer for total shareholder return. So for 2008, well, the capital gain we got was 95 cents. The dividend was 38.5 cents. And that total return over... 740 cents so let's just check so the 95 cents plus the 38.5 cents is 133.5 cents so that's the capital gain plus the dividends out of 740 which was the share price last year gives us an 18 percent total shareholder return and that's what shareholders will be interested in what is the capital gain plus the dividend as a percentage of what you needed to invest, which was $7.40. So that capital gain that we worked out last time of 12.8% plus the dividend yield of 5.2% gives us 18%, which matches the total shareholder return that we have here. So that's just an alternative way you could do it. But stick to the basics if you're happy with that, which will be the dividends 
plus the share price growth over the previous year's share price. So for 2009, we do the same again. The share price had gone down by 187 cents, but we had a dividend of 40 cents. So the total there will be 137 of a loss over 835, which gives us a decrease in shareholder return of 17.6%. Again, that corresponds to what we saw with 4.8% of our dividend yield, less the reduction in capital gain of 22.4%, which gives us that shareholder return of minus 17.6%. So that's the calculations. I'm taking you through that nice and slowly to make sure we're happy with it. But you need to be able to do those pretty quickly because we're only talking about two marks for each of them uh, in total. So two marks for the capital gain, two marks for the dividend yield uh, and possibly two marks for the total shareholder return. But certainly no more than five in total for that. So that leaves us able to discuss it. We need to discuss that with respect to the returns predicted by CAPM. Now, we'll look at CAPM in a bit more detail later, but you should be aware of it. Remember, CAPM will predict what the return on equity should be before each share, so for each individual business. And CAPM has said that they expected a 12% growth in 08 and an 8% growth in 09. So that's what they were predicting based on CAPM. Well, we know that that hasn't happened. So why has it not happened? So looking at that, we can see that the actual return to the shareholder calculated as a total shareholder return is different from that predicted by CAPM. So we can see that it's clearly different. Now in 2008, we prov provided a better return we got 18% of a total shareholder return compared to 12% predicted by CAPM. However, in 2009, CAPM predicted 8% growth and we got minus 17.6%. So that's not the same. Why could it be different? Well, we need to think about what CAPM actually tells us. CAPM is predicting what the return will be, and it's generally going to be positive. That's because it's an average return. It filters out the fact that you might have a fluctuating return. We'll always want to get in general, in total, over a number of years, a positive return, and that should happen. But because it's an average, it may well fluctuate. So one year it might go down by 10%, the next year up by 20%, the next year down by 5%. Well, overall, it's gone up, but it's fluctuated between the two. So in that respect, although CAPM produces an average return expected, it doesn't really give us the detail that we expect on a yearly basis. So companies may on occasion give negative returns, which has happened in this case. CAPM wouldn't predict that. The return in 2008 was greater than the cost of equity. However, in this example, there may be a difference between the cost of equity in 2008 and 2009. So we really, CAPM doesn't predict us what happens in a specific year. It tells us on average what we expect. Whereas we're looking here at what happened in individual years. So the next bit of this is to discuss the other financial information provided. So just looking at the table of information, the only other thing that I'm going to calculate here is that I want to look at the price to earnings ratio and we'll get the other information onto this table. So in 07, well, earnings per share was 61 cents. We don't have last year's share price. So we don't predict anything on the price to earnings ratio. In 2008, closing share price was $8.35. The earnings per share was 64.2 cents. So that gives us a price to earnings ratio of 13 times. So that will be the share price over the earnings per share. Remember that tells us what the market thinks of the share. So high price to earnings ratio, they're willing to pay a high multiple of its current earnings to own the share. Dividend per share was 38.5 cents, just for information. 
And 2009, closing share price $6.48, earnings per share is 58.9, and we have 11 times price to earnings. So that means that investors are willing to pay 11 times current earnings to own the share. So we can see it's come down, and that would mean that the market is a little bit unsure. They thought they'd pay 13 times, not going to do that anymore probably mostly because of the reduction in the share price. And the dividends per share is 40 cents. So we're particularly interested in 08 and 09. That's why we're looking at those two years and not 07. So that's some additional information for us to put into our answer. And we're looking at that information to say, right, what other findings have we made? Well, we can say that there has been little growth in turnover. So looking at the turnover, we can see that it increased 3% in 08 and it didn't increase at all in 09. It stayed the same. Also, looking at our earnings per share that we calculated, grew in 08 by 4.1%, went down in 09 by 8.3%. So earnings per share, we said, was one of the key financial objectives and it's gone down in 09. Investors will be interested in that. Dividends per share, looking at that, we can see it grew by 4.1% and still went up in 09. So even though they weren't doing as well, they maintained the dividend. And often a business will do that. Even if the company is experiencing financial difficulties, they'll still try to keep the dividend to reassure shareholders. So that may well be an explanation for that. However, a more pressing issue is that the shareholder has experienced a capital loss. Also a decline in the price to earnings ratio and that may be a sign that the market is losing confidence as we said. Remember price to earnings ratio really tells us what the market thinks of the share. It's gone down, they may be starting to worry about how this share is performing. Also, we could say that if the shareholders were aware of the planned suspension on dividends, so it's anticipated that they may actually not pay the dividend, well, that would be an issue. Now, the, the general public won't be aware of that at that point. The shareholders may not be aware. But if they disclose that information, well, then that would become an issue. So, for example, if they wanted to increase their capital, issue debt or equity, the market would generally find out that they weren't going to pay that dividend. Analysts would analyse the shares and realise that that was likely to happen. So it would become public knowledge and may again damage the share price. So the key points that you should have been drawing out here was talk about the figures. First of all, the turnover, how it has grown and what has happened, then the earnings per share, and then the dividends. That gives you three areas to discuss, and we want to say what has happened, and what could that signal give to the market. So that's what we've done here, and there's probably more than you need there, but that would definitely get you full marks for that question. So hopefully you're aware of everything we looked at and happy with it. Um, go back through this question again if you had trouble with it. Maybe attempt it again without the answer and see how you do in doing it once more.